Section six of Beacon Lights of History, Volume Seven: Great Women by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Saint Teresa, Part One, A.D. fifteen fifteen to fifteen eighty two. Religious enthusiasm. I have already painted in Cleopatra, to the best of my ability, the pagan woman of antiquity, reveling in the pleasures of vanity and sensuality, with a feeble moral sense, and without any distinct recognition of God or immortality. The genius of paganism was simply the deification of the Venus Polyhymnia, the adornment and pleasure of what is perishable in man. It directed all the energies of human nature to the pampering and decorating of this mortal body, not believing that the mind and soul which animate it, and which are the sources of all its glory, would ever live beyond the grave. A few sages believed differently, men who rose above the spirit of paganism, but not such men as Alexander or Caesar or Antony, the foremost men of all the world in grand ambitions and successes. Taking it for granted that this world is the only theatre for enjoyment or action or thought, men naturally said, Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And hence no higher life was essayed than that which furnished sensual enjoyments or incited an ambition to be strong and powerful. Of course, riches were sought above everything, since these furnished the means of gratifying those pleasures which were most valued, or stimulating that vanity whose essence is self-idolatry. With this universal rush of humanity after pleasures which centered in the body, the soul was left dishonored and uncared for, except by a few philosophers. I do not now speak of the mind, for there were intellectual pleasures derived from conversation, books, and works of art. And some called the mind divine, in distinction from matter, some speculated on the nature of each, and made mind and matter in perpetual antagonism, as the good and evil forces of the universe. But the prevailing opinion was that the whole man perished, or became absorbed in the elemental forces of nature, or reappeared again in new forms upon the earth, to expiate those sins of which human nature is conscious. To some men were given longings after immortality, not absolute convictions, men like Plato, Socrates, and Cicero. But I do not speak of these illustrious exceptions. I mean the great mass of the people, especially the rich and powerful and pleasure-seeking, those whose supreme delight was in banquets, palaces, or intoxicating excitements, like chariot racings and gladiatorial shows yea triumphal processions to raise the importance of the individual self and stimulate vanity and pride hence paganism put a small value comparatively on even intellectual enjoyments it cultivated those arts which appealed to the senses more than to the mind it paid dearly for any sort of intellectual training which could be utilized oratory for instance to enable a lawyer to gain a case or a statesman to control a mob it rewarded those poets who could sing blended praises to Bacchus and Venus, or who could excite the passions at the theater. But it paid still higher prices to athletes and dancers, at almost no price at all to those who sought to stimulate a love of knowledge for its own sake. Men like Socrates, for example, who walked barefooted and lived on fifty dollars a year, and who at last was killed out of pure hatred for the truths he told and the manner in which he told them, this martyrdom occurring in the most intellectual city of the world. In both Greece and Rome there was an intellectual training for men bent on utilitarian ends, even as we endow schools of science and technology to enable us to conquer nature, and to become strong and rich and comfortable. But there were no schools for women, whose intellects were disdained, and who were valued only as servants or animals, either to drudge or to please the senses. But even if there were some women in paganism of high mental education, if women sometimes rose above their servile condition by pure intellect, and amused men by their wit and humor, still their souls were little thought of. Now it is the soul of woman, not her mind, and still less her body, which elevates her, and makes her, in some important respects, the superior of man himself. He has dominion over her by force of will, intellect, and physical power. When she has dominion over him, it is by those qualities which come from her soul, her superior nature, greater than both mind and body. Paganism never recognized the superior nature, especially in woman, that which must be fed, even in this world, or there will be constant unrest and discontent. And inasmuch as paganism did not feed it, women were unhappy, especially those who had great capacities. They may have been comfortable, but they were not contented. Hence women made no great advance either in happiness or power until Christianity revealed the greatness of the soul, its perpetual longings, its infinite capacities, and its future satisfactions. The spiritual exercises of the soul then became the greatest source of comfort amid those evils which once ended in despair. With every true believer, the salvation of so precious a thing necessarily became the end of life, for Christianity taught that the soul might be lost. In view of the soul's transcendent value, therefore, the pleasures of the body became of but little account in comparison. 
riches are good power is desirable eating and drinking are very pleasant praise flattery admiration all these things delight us and under paganism were sought and prized but christianity said what shall a man give in exchange for his soul christianity then set about in earnest to rescue this soul which paganism had disregarded in consequence of this women began to rise and shine in a new light they gained a new charm even mortal beauty yea a new power so that they could laugh at ancient foes and say triumphantly when those foes sought to crush them o grave where is thy victory o death where is thy sting there is no beauty among women like this moral beauty whose seat is in the soul it is not only a radiance but it is a defence it protects women from the wrath and passion of men with glory irradiating every feature it says to the boldest thus far shalt thou come and no farther it is a benediction to the poor and a welcome to the rich it shines with such unspeakable loveliness so rich in blessing and so refined in ecstasy that men gaze with more than admiration even with sentiments bordering on that adoration which the middle ages felt for the mother of our lord and which they also bestowed upon departed saints in the immortal paintings of raphael and murillo we get some idea of this moral beauty which is so hard to copy so women passed gradually from contempt and degradation to the veneration of men when her soul was elevated by the power which paganism never knew but christianity in the hands of degenerate romans and gothic barbarians made many mistakes in its efforts to save so priceless a thing as a human soul among other things it instituted monasteries and convents both for men and women in which they sought to escape the contaminating influences which had degraded them if paganism glorified the body monasticism despised it in the fierce protests against the peculiar sins which had marked pagan life gluttony wine drinking unchastity ostentatious vanities and turbulent mirth monasticism decreed abstinence perpetual virginity the humblest dress the entire disuse of ornaments silence and meditation these were supposed to disarm the demons who led into foul temptation moreover monasticism encouraged whatever it thought would make the soul triumphant over the body almost independent of it whatever would feed the soul it said should be sought and whatever would pamper the body should be avoided as a natural consequence of all of this piety gradually came to seek its most congenial home in monastic retreats and to take on a dreamy visionary and introspective mood the saints saw visions of both angels and devils and a superstitious age believed in the revelations the angels appeared to comfort and sustain the soul in temptations and trials and the devils came to pervert and torment it good judgment and severe criticism were lost to the church and moreover the gloomy theology of the middle ages all based on the fears of endless physical torments for the wretched body was the source of all evil and therefore must be punished gave sometimes a repulsive form to piety itself intellectually that piety now excites our contempt because it was so much mixed up with dreams and ecstasies and visions and hallucinations it produces a moral aversion also because it was austere inhuman and sometimes cruel both monks and nuns when they conformed to the rules of their order were sad solitary dreary-looking people although their faces shone occasionally in the light of ecstatic visions of heaven and the angels but whatever mistakes monasticism made however repulsive the religious life of the middle ages in fact all its social life still it must be admitted that the aim of the time was high men and women were enslaved by superstitions but they were not pagan our own age is in some respects more pagan than were the darkest times of medieval violence and priestly despotism since we are reviving the very things against which christianity protested as dangerous and false the pomps the banquets the ornaments the arts of the old pagan world now all this is preliminary to what i have to say of saint teresa we cannot do justice to this remarkable woman without considering the sentiments of her day and those circumstances that controlled her we cannot properly estimate her piety that for which she was made a saint in the roman calendar without being reminded of the different estimate which paganism and christianity placed upon the soul and consequently the superior condition of women in our modern times nor must we treat lightly or sneeringly that institution which was certainly one of the steps by which women rose in the scale both of religious and social progress for several ages nuns were the only charitable women except queens and princesses of whom we have record but they were drawn to their calm retreats not merely to serve god more effectually nor merely to perform deeds of charity but to study as we have elsewhere said the convents in those days were schools no less than asylums and hospitals and were especially valued for female education however in these retreats religion especially became a passion there was a fervor in it which in our times is unknown it was not a matter of opinion but of faith 
in these times there may be more wisdom but in the middle ages there was more zeal and more unselfishness and more intensity all which is illustrated by the sainted woman i propose to speak of saint teresa was born at avila in castile in the year 1515 at the close of the middle ages but she really belonged to the middle ages since all the habits customs and opinions of spain at that time were medieval the reformation never gained a foothold in spain none of its doctrines penetrated that country still less modified or changed its religious customs institutions or opinions and hence saint teresa virtually belonged to the age of bernard and anselm and elizabeth of hungary she was of a good family as much distinguished for virtues as for birth both her father and mother were very religious and studious reading good books and practicing the virtues which catholicism ever enjoined alms-giving to the poor and kindness to the sick and infirm truthful chaste temperate and god-fearing they had twelve children all good though teresa seems to have been the favorite from her natural sprightliness and enthusiasm among the favorite books of the middle ages were the lives of saints and martyrs and the history of these martyrs made so great an impression on the mind of the youthful teresa that she and one of her brothers meditated a flight into africa that they might be put to death by the moors and thus earn the crown of martyrdom as well as the eternal rewards in heaven which martyrdom was supposed to secure this scheme being defeated by their parents they sought to be hermits in the garden which belonged to their house playing the parts of monks and nuns at eleven teresa lost her mother and took to reading romances which it seems were books of knight errantry at the close of the chivalric period these romances were innumerable and very extravagant and absurd and were ridiculed by cervantes half a century afterwards in his immortal don quixote although spain was medieval in its piety in the sixteenth century this was the period of its highest intellectual culture especially in the drama de vega and cervantes were enough of themselves to redeem spain from any charges of intellectual stupidity but for the inquisition and the dominican monks and the jesuits and the demoralization which followed the conquest of cortez and pizarro spain might have rivaled germany france and england in the greatness of her literature at this time there must have been considerable cultivation among the class to which teresa belonged although she never was sullied by what are called mortal sins it would appear that as a girl of fourteen teresa was like most other girls fond of dress and perfumes and ornaments elaborate hair-dressing and of anything which would make the person attractive her companions were also gay young ladies of rank as fond of finery as she was whose conversation was not particularly edifying but whose morals were above reproach Teresa was sent to a convent in her native town by her father, that she might be removed from the influence of gay companions, especially her male cousins, who could not be denied the house. At first she was quite unhappy, finding the convent dull, triste, and strict. I cannot conceive of a convent being a very pleasant place for a worldly young lady, in any country or in any age of the world. Its monotony and routine and mechanical duties must ever have been irksome the pleasing manners and bright conversation of teresa caused the nuns to take an unusual interest in her and one of them in particular exercised a great deal of influence upon her so that she was inclined at times to become a nun herself though not of a very strict order since she was still fond of the pleasures of the world at sixteen teresa's poor health made it necessary for her to return to her father's house when she recovered she spent some time with her uncle afterwards a monk who made her read good books and impressed upon her the vanity of the world in a few months she resolved to become a nun out of servile fear rather than love as she avers the whole religious life of the middle ages was based on fear the fear of being tortured forever by devils in hell so universal and powerful was this fear that it became the leading idea of the age from which very few were ever emancipated on this idea were based the excommunications the interdicts and all the spiritual weapons by which the clergy ruled the minds of the people on this their ascendancy rested they would have had but little power without it it was therefore their interest to perpetuate it and as they ruled by exciting fears so they themselves were objects of fear rather than of love all this tended to make the middle ages gloomy funereal repulsive austere there was a time when i felt a sort of poetic interest in these dark times and called them ages of faith but the older i grow and the more i read and reflect the more dreary do those ages seem to me think of a state of society when everything suggested wrath and vengeance even in the character of god and when this world was supposed to be under the dominion of devils think of an education which impressed on the minds of interesting young girls that the trifling sins which they committed every day and which proceeded from the exuberance of animal spirits justly doomed them to everlasting burnings without expiations a creed so cruel as to undermine the health and make life itself a misery think of a spiritual despotism so complete that confessors and spiritual fathers could impose or remove these expiations and thus open the door to heaven or hell 
and yet this despotism was the logical result of a generally accepted idea instead of the idea being an outgrowth of the despotism since the clergy who controlled society by working on its fears were themselves as complete victims and slaves as the people whom they led this idea that the soul would be lost unless sins were expiated and expiated by self-inflicted torments on the body paul taught a more cheerful doctrine of forgiveness based on divine and infinite love on faith and repentance the middle ages also believed in repentance but taught that repentance and penance were synonymous the asceticism of the church in its conflict with paganism led to this perversion of apostolic theology the very idea that christianity was sent to subvert that is the old oriental idea of self-expiation seen among the fakirs and sophies and brahmins alike and in a less repulsive form among the pharisees became once again the ruling idea of theologians the theologians of the middle ages taught this doctrine of penance and self-expiation with peculiar zeal and sincerity and fear rather than love ruled the christian world hence the austeria of convent life its piety centered in the perpetual crucifixion of the body in the suppression of desires and pleasures which are perfectly innocent the highest deal of christian life according to convent rules was a living and protracted martyrdom and in some cases even the degradation of our common humanity christianity nowhere enjoins the eradication of passions and appetites but the control of them it would not mutilate and disfigure the body for it is a sacred temple to be made beautiful and attractive on the other hand the middle ages strove to make the body appear repulsive and the most loathsome forms of misery and disease to be hailed as favorite modes of penance and as christ suffered agonies on the cross so the imitation of christ was supposed to be a cheerful and ready acceptance of voluntary humiliation and bodily torments the more dreadful to bear the more acceptable to deity as a propitiation for sin is this statement denied read the biographies of the saints of the middle ages see how penance and voluntary suffering and unnecessary exposure of the health and eager attention to the sick and loathsome and contagious diseases and the severest and most protracted fastings and vigils enter into their piety and how these extorted popular admiration and received the applause and rewards of the rulers of the church i never read a book which left on my mind such repulsive impressions of medieval piety as the life of catherine siena by her confessor himself one of the great ecclesiastical dignitaries of the age i never read anything so debasing and degrading to our humanity one turns with disgust from the narration of her lauded penances so we see in the church of the middle ages the church of saint teresa two great ideas struggling for the mastery yet both obscured and perverted faith in a crucified redeemer which gave consolation and hope and penance rather than repentance which sought to impose the fetters of the ancient spiritual despotisms in the early church faith and repentance went hand in hand together to conquer the world and to introduce joy and peace and hope among believers in the middle ages faith was divorced from repentance and took penance instead as a companion an old enemy so that there was discord in the christian camp and fears returned and joys were clouded sometimes faith prevailed over penance as in the monastery of beck where anselm taught a cheerful philosophy or in the monastery of clairvaux where bernard lived in seraphic ecstasies his soul going out in love and joy and then again penance prevailed as in those grim retreats where hard inquisitors inflicted their cruel torments but penance on the whole was the ruling power and cast over society its funereal veil of dreariness and fear yet penance enslaving as it was was still clung to the infinite value of the soul the grandest fact in all revelations and hence society did not relax into paganism penance would save the soul though surrounding it with gloom maceration heavy labors bitter tears terrible anxieties the wearied pilgrim the isolated monk the weeping nun the groaning peasant the penitent baron were not thrown into absolute despair since there was a possibility of appeasing divine wrath and since they all knew that christ had died in order to save some yea all who conformed to the direction of those spiritual guides which the church and the age imposed such was catholic theology when teresa an enthusiastic amiable and virtuous girl of sixteen but at one time giddy and worldly wished to enter a convent for the salvation of her soul she says she was influenced by servile fear and not by love it is now my purpose to show how this servile fear was gradually subdued by divine grace and how she became radiant with love in short an emancipated woman in all the glorious liberty of the gospel of christ although it was not until she had passed through a most melancholy experience of bondage to the leading ideas of her church and age it is this emancipation which made her one of the great women of history not complete and entire but still remarkable especially for a spanish woman it was love casting out fear after a mental struggle of three months teresa resolved to become a nun but her father objected partly out of his great love for her and partly on account of her delicate and fragile body 
Her health had always been poor. She was subject to fainting fits and burning fevers. Whether her father at last consented to her final retirement from the world, I do not discover from her biography, but with his consent or without it, she entered the convent and assumed the religious habit, not without bitter pangs on leaving her home, for she did violence to her feelings, having no strong desire for monastic seclusion, and being warmly attached to her father. Neither love to God nor a yearning after monastic life impelled the sacrifice, as she admits, but a perverted conscience." she felt herself in danger of damnation for her sins and wished to save her soul and knew no other way than to enter upon the austerities of the convent which she endured with remarkable patience and submission suffering not merely from severities to which she was unaccustomed but great illness in consequence of them a year was passed in protracted miseries amounting to martyrdom from fainting fits heart palpitations and other infirmities of the body the doctors could do nothing for her and her father was obliged to order her removal to a more helpful monastery where no vows of enclosure were taken and there she remained a year with no relief to her sufferings for three months her only recreation was books which fortified her courage she sought instruction but found no one who could instruct her so as to give repose to her struggling soul she endeavored to draw her thoughts from herself by reading she could not even pray without a book she was afraid to be left alone with herself her situation was made still worse by the fact that her superiors did not understand her when they noticed that she sought solitude and shed tears for her sins they fancied she had a discontented disposition and added to her unhappiness by telling her so but she conformed to all the rules irksome or not and endured every mortification and even performed acts of devotion which were not required she envied the patience of a poor woman who died of the most painful ulcers and thought it would be a blessing if she could be afflicted in the same way in order as she said to purchase eternal good and this strange desire was fulfilled for a severe and painful malady afflicted her for three years end of section six section seven of beacon lights of history volume seven great women by john lord this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. St. Teresa, Part Two. Again was she removed to some place for cure, for her case was desperate. And here her patience was supernal. Yet patience under bodily torments did not give the sought for peace. It happened that a learned ecclesiastic of noble family lived in this place, and she sought relief in confessions to him. With a rare judgment and sense, and perhaps pride and delicacy, she disliked to confess to ignorant priests. She said that the half-learned did her more harm than good. The learned were probably more lenient to her, and more in sympathy with her, and assured her that those sins were only venial which she had supposed were mortal. But she soon was obliged to give up this confessor, since he began to confess to her, and to confess sins in comparison with which the sins she confessed were venial indeed. He not only told her of his slavery to a bad woman, but confessed a love for Teresa herself, which she of course repelled, though not with the aversion she ought to have felt. It seems that her pious talk was instrumental in effecting his deliverance from a base bondage. He soon after died, and piously, she declared, so that she considered it certain that his soul was saved. Teresa remained three months in this place, in most grievous sufferings, for the remedy was worse than the disease. Again her father took her home, since all despaired of her recovery, her nervous system being utterly shattered, and her pains incessant by day and by night. The least touch was a torment. At last she sank into a state of insensibility from sheer exhaustion, so that she was supposed to be dying, even to be dead, and her grave was dug, and the sacrament of extreme unction was administered. She rallied from this prostration, however, and returned to the convent, though in a state of extreme weakness, and so remained for about eight months. For three years she was a cripple, and could move about only on all fours, but she was resigned to the will of God. It was then, amid the maladies of her body, that she found relief to her overburdened soul in prayer. She no longer prayed with a book, mechanically and by rote, but mentally, with earnestness, and with the understanding. And she prayed directly to God Almighty, and thereby came, she says, to love Him. And with prayer came new virtues. She now ceases to speak ill of people, and persuades others to cease from all detractions, so that absent people are safe. She speaks of God as her heavenly physician, who alone could cure her. 
she now desires not sickness to show her patience but health in order to serve god better she begins to abominate those forms and ceremonies to which so many were slavishly devoted and which she regards as superstitious but she has drawbacks and relapses and is pulled back by temptations and vanities so that she is ashamed to approach god with that familiarity which fervent prayer requires then she fears hell which she thinks she deserves she has not yet reached the placidity of a pardoned soul perfection is very slow to be reached and that is what the middle ages required in order to exercise the fears of divine wrath not however until these fears are exercised can there be the liberty of the gospel or the full triumph of love thus for several years teresa passed a miserable life since the more she prayed the more she realized her faults and these she could not correct because her soul was not a master but a slave she was drawn two ways in opposite directions she made good resolutions but failed to keep them and then there was the deluge of tears the feeling that she was the weakest and wickedest of all creatures for nearly twenty years she passed through this tempestuous sea between failings and risings enjoying neither the sweetness of god nor the pleasures of the world but she did not lose the courage of applying herself to mental prayer this fortified her this was her stronghold this united her to god she was persuaded if she persevered in this whatever sin she might commit or whatever temptation might be presented that in the end her lord would bring her safe to the port of salvation so she prayed without ceasing she especially insisted on the importance of mental prayer which is i suppose what is called holy meditation as a sort of treaty of friendship with her lord at last she feels that the lord assists her in his great love and she begins to trust in him she declares that prayer is the gate through which the lord bestows upon her his favors and it is only through this that any comfort comes then she begins to enjoy sermons which once tormented her whether good or bad so long as god is spoken of for she now loves him and she cannot hear too much of him she loves she delights to see her lord's picture since it aids her to see him inwardly and to feel that he is always near which is her constant desire about this time the confessions of st augustine were put into teresa's hands one of the few immortal books which are endeared to the heart of christians this book was a comfort and enlightenment to her she thinking that the lord would forgive her as he did those saints who had been great sinners because he loved them when she meditated on the conversion of st augustine how he heard the voice in the garden it seemed to her that the lord equally spoke to her and thus she was filled with gratitude and joy after this her history is the enumeration of the favors which god gave her and of the joys of prayer which seemed to her to be the very joys of heaven she longs more and more for her divine spouse to whom she is spiritually wedded she pants for him as the heart pants for the water brook she cannot be separated from him neither death nor hell can separate her from his love he is infinitely precious to her he is chief among ten thousand she blesses his holy name in her exceeding joy she cries o lord of my soul o my eternal good in her ecstasy she sings absent from thee my saviour dear i call not life this living here ah lord i my light and living breath take me o oh, take me from this death and burst the bars that sever me from my true life above think how i die thy face to see and cannot live away from thee o oh, my eternal love thus she composes canticles and dries her tears feeling that the love of god does not consist in these but in serving him with fidelity and devotion she is filled with the graces of humility and praises god that she is permitted to speak of things relating to him she is filled also with strength since it is he who strengthens her she is perpetually refreshed since she drinks from a divine fountain she is in a sort of trance of delight from the enjoyment of divine blessings her soul is elevated to rapture she feels that her salvation through grace is assured she no longer has fears of devils or of hell since with an everlasting love she is beloved and her lover is christ she has broken the bondage of the middle ages and she has broken it by prayer she is an emancipated woman and can now afford to devote herself to practical duties she visits the sick she dispenses charities she gives wise counsels for with all her visionary piety she has good sense in the things of the world and is as practical as she is spiritual and transcendental 
and all this in the midst of visions i will not dwell on these visions the weak point in her religious life though they are visions of beauty not of devils of celestial spirits who came to comfort her and who filled her soul with joy and peace a little bird i am shut from the fields of air and in my cage i sit and sing to him who placed me there well pleased a prisoner to be because my god it pleases thee she is bathed in the glory of her lord and her face shines with the radiance of heaven with the moral beauty which the greatest of spanish painters represents on his canvas and she is beloved by everybody is universally venerated for her virtues as well as for her spiritual elevation the greatest ecclesiastical dignitaries come to see her and encourage her and hold converse with her for her intellectual gifts were as remarkable as her piety her conversion it appears was charming her influence over the highest people was immense she pleased she softened and she elevated all who knew her she reigned in her convent as madame de stal reigned in her salon she was supposed to have reached perfection and yet she never claimed perfection but sadly felt her imperfections and confessed them she was very fond of the society of learned men from first to last but formed no friendships except with those whom she believed to be faithful servants of god at this period teresa meditated the foundation of a new convent of the carmelite order to be called saint joseph after the name of her patron saint but here she found great difficulty as her plans were not generally approved by her superiors or the learned men whom she consulted they were deemed impracticable for she insisted that the convent should not be endowed nor be allowed to possess property in all the monasteries of the middle ages the monks if individually poor might be collectively rich and all the famous monasteries came gradually to be as well endowed as oxford and cambridge universities were this proved in the end an evil since the monks became lazy and luxurious and proud they could afford to be idle and with idleness and luxury came corruption the austere lives of the founders of these monasteries gave them a reputation for sanctity and learning and this brought them wealth rich people who had no near relatives were almost certain to leave them something in their wills and the richer the monasteries became the greedier their rulers were teresa determined to set a new example she did not institute any stricter rules she was emancipated from austerities but she resolved to make her nuns dependent on the lord rather than on rich people nor was she ambitious of founding a large convent she thought that thirteen women together were enough gradually she brought the provincial of the order over to her views and also the celebrated friar peter of alcantara the most eminent ecclesiastic in spain but the townspeople of avila were full of opposition they said it was better for teresa to remain where she was that there was no necessity for another convent and that it was a very foolish thing so great was the outcry that the provincial finally withdrew his consent he also deemed the revenue to be too uncertain then the advance of a celebrated dominican was sought who took eight days to consider the matter and was at first inclined to recommend the abandonment of the project but on further reflection he could see no harm in it and encouraged it so a small house was bought for the nuns must have some shelter over their heads the provincial changed his opinion again and now favored the enterprise it was a small affair but a great thing to teresa her friend the dominican wrote letters to rome and the provincial offered no further objection moreover she had bright visions of celestial comforters but the superior of her convent not wishing the enterprise to succeed and desiring to get her out of the way sent teresa to toledo to visit and comfort a sick lady of rank with whom she remained six months here she met many eminent men chiefly ecclesiastics of the dominican and jesuit orders and here she inspired other ladies to follow her example among others a noble nun of her own order who sold all she had and walked to rome barefooted in order to obtain leave to establish a religious house like that proposed by teresa at last there came letters and a brief from rome for the establishment of the convent and teresa was elected prioress in the year fifteen sixty two but the opposition still continued and the most learned and influential were resolved in disestablishing the house the matter at last reached the ears of the king and council and an order came requiring a statement as to how the monastery was to be founded everything was discouraging teresa as usual took refuge in prayer and went to the lord and said this house is not mine it is established for thee and since there is no one to conduct the case do thou undertake it from that time she considered the matter settled nevertheless the opposition continued 
much to the astonishment of Teresa, who could not see how a prioress and twelve nuns could be injurious to the city. Finally, opposition so far ceased that it was agreed that the house should be unmolested, provided it were endowed. On this point, however, Teresa was firm, feeling that if she once began to admit revenue, the people would not afterwards allow her to refuse it. So amid great opposition she at last took up her abode in the convent she had founded, and wanted for nothing, since alms, all unsolicited, poured in sufficient for all necessities, and the attention of the nuns was given to their duties without anxieties or obstruction, in all the dignity of voluntary poverty. I look upon this reformation of the Carmelite order as very remarkable. The nuns did not go around among rich people supplicating their aid as was generally customary, for no convent or monastery was ever rich enough, in its own opinion. Still less did they say to rich people, Ye are the lords and masters of mankind, we recognize your greatness and your power. Deign to give us from your abundance, not that we may live comfortably when serving the Lord, but live in luxury like you, and compete with you in the sumptuousness of our banquets, and in the costliness of our furniture and our works of art, and be your companions and equals in social distinctions, and be enrolled with you as leaders of society. On the contrary, they said, we ask nothing from you. We do not wish to be rich. We prefer poverty. We would not be encumbered with useless impediments, too much camp equipage, while marching to do battle with the forces of the devil. Christ is our captain. He can take care of his own troops. He will not let us starve. And if we do suffer, what of that? He suffered for our sake. Shall we not suffer for his cause? The convent of St. Joseph was founded in 1562, after Teresa had passed twenty-nine years in the convent of the Incarnation she died fifteen eighty two at the age of sixty seven after twenty years of successful labors in the convent she had founded revered by everybody the friend of some of the most eminent men in spain including the celebrated borgia ex-duke of candia and general of the jesuits who took the same interest in teresa that fenelon did in madame guyon she lived to see established sixteen convents of nuns all obeying her reformed rule and most of them founded by her amid great difficulties and opposition when she founded the Carmelite convent of Toledo, she had only four ducats to begin with. Someone objected to the smallness of the sum, when she replied, Teresa and this money are indeed nothing, but God and Teresa and four ducats can accomplish anything. It was amid the fatigues incident to the founding a convent in Burgos that she sickened and died. It was not, however, merely from her labors as a reformer and nun that St. Teresa won her fame, but also for her writings, which blaze with genius, although chiefly confined to her own religious experience. These consist of an account of her own life, and various letters and mystic treatises, some description of her spiritual conflicts and ecstasies, others giving accounts of her religious labors in the founding of reformed orders and convents, while the most famous is a rapt portrayal of the progress of the soul to the highest heaven. Her own memoirs remind one of the Confessions of St. Augustine, and of the Imitation of Christ, by Thomas a Kempis. People do not read such books in these times to any extent, at least in this country, but they have ever been highly valued on the continent of Europe. The biographers of St. Teresa have been numerous, some of them very distinguished, like Ribera, Yepes, and St. Marie. Bousset, while he condemned Madame Guillon for the same mystic piety which marked St. Teresa, still bowed down to the authority of the writings of the saint, while Fleury quotes them with the decrees of the Council of Trent. But St. Teresa ever was submissive to the authority of the Pope and of her spiritual directors. She would not have been canonized by Gregory the Fifteenth had she not been. So long as priests and nuns have been submissive to the authority of the Church, the Church has been lenient to their opinions. Until the Reformation, there was great practical freedom of opinion in the Catholic Church. Nor was the Church of the sixteenth century able to see the logical tendency of the mysticism of St. Teresa, since it was not coupled with rebellion against spiritual despotism. It was not until the logical and dogmatic intellect of Bousset discerned the spiritual independence of the Jansenists and Quietists that persecution began against them. Had St. Teresa lived a century later, she would probably have shared the fate of Madame Guillon, whom she resembled more closely than any other woman that I have read of, in her social position, in her practical intellect, despite the visions of a dreamy piety, in her passionate love of the Saviour, in her method of prayer, in her spiritual conflicts, in the benevolence which marked all her relations with the world, in the divine charity which breathed through all her words, and in the triumph of love over all the fears inspired by a gloomy theology and a superstitious priesthood. 
both of these eminent women were poets of no ordinary merit both enjoyed the friendship of the most eminent men of their age both craved the society of the learned both were of high birth and beautiful in their youth and fitted to adorn society by their brilliant talk as well as graceful manners both were amiable and sought to please and loved distinction and appreciation both were catholics yet permeated with the spirit of protestantism so far as religion is made a matter between god and the individual soul and marked by internal communion with the deity rather than by outward acts of prescribed forms both had confessors yet both maintained the freedom of their minds and souls and knew of no binding authority but the divine voice which appealed to their conscience and heart and that divine word which is written in the scriptures after the love of god had subdued their hearts we read but little of penances or self-expiations or forms of worship or church ceremonies or priestly rigors or any of the slaveries and formalities which bound ordinary people their piety was mystical sometimes visionary and not always intelligible but deep sincere and lofty of the two women i think saint Teresa was the more remarkable had the most originality madame guillon seems to have borrowed much from her especially in her methods of prayer the influence of saint Teresa's life and writings has been eminent and marked not only in the catholic but in the protestant church if not direct it has been indirect she had that active ardent nature which sets at defiance a formal piety and became an example to noble women in a more enlightened if less poetic age she was the precursor of madame de chantal of a francis de salé of a mere angelique the learned and saintly port royalists in many respects were her disciples we even see a resemblance to her spiritual exercises in the thoughts of pascal we see her mystical love of the saviour in the poetry of cowper and watts and wesley the same sentiments she uttered appear even in the devotional works of jeremy taylor and jonathan edwards the protestant theology of the last century was in harmony with hers in its essential features in the pilgrim's progress of bunyan we have no more graphic pictures of the sense of sin the justice of its punishment and the power by which it is broken than are to be found in the writings of this saintly woman in no protestant hymnals do we find a warmer desire for a spiritual union with the author of our salvation in none do we see the aspiring soul seeking to climb to the regions of eternal love more than in her exultant melodies for uncreated charms i burn opposed by slavish fears no more for one in whom i may discern e'en when he frowns a sweetness i adore that remarkable work of fenelon in which he defends madame guillon called maxims of the saints would equally apply to saint Teresa, in fact to all those who have been distinguished for an inward life from saint augustine to richard baxter for unselfish love resignation to the divine will self-renunciation meditation too deep for words and union with christ as represented by the figure of the bride and bridegroom this is christianity as it has appeared in all ages both among catholic and protestant saints it may seem to some visionary to others unreasonable and to others again repulsive but this has been the life and joy of those whom the church has honored and commended it has raised them above the despair of paganism and the superstitions of the middle ages it is the love which casteth out fear producing in the harassed soul repose and rest amid the doubts and disappointments of life it is not inspired by duty it does not rest on philanthropy it is not the religion of humanity it is a gift bestowed by the father of lights and will be to remotest ages the most precious boon which he bestows on those who seek his guidance authorities v de saint therese escrite par a m m lettres de saint therese les ouvrages de saint therese biographie universelle fraser's magazine volume sixty five fifty nine butler's lives of the saints digby's ages of faith the catholic histories of the church especially fleury's maxims of the saints lives of saint teresa by ribera yepez and sainte marie end of section seven section eight of beacon lights of history volume seven great women by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand madame de maintenon part one a d sixteen thirty five to seventeen nineteen the political woman i present madame de maintenon as one of those great women who have exerted a powerful influence on the political destinies of a nation since she was the life of the french monarchy for more than thirty years during the reign of louis the fourteenth 
in the earlier part of her career she was a queen of society but her social triumphs pale before the lustre of that power which she exercised as the wife of the greatest monarch of the age so far as splendor and magnificence can make a monarch great no woman in modern times ever rose so high from a humble position with the exception of catherine the first wife of peter the great she was not born a duchess like some of those brilliant women who shed glory around the absolute throne of the proudest monarch of his century but rose to her magnificent position by pure merit her graces her virtues and her abilities having won the respect and admiration of the overlauded but sagacious king of france and yet she was well born so far as blood is concerned since the protestant family of duaubigine to which she belonged was one of the oldest in the kingdom her father however was a man of reckless extravagance and infamous habits and committed follies and crimes which caused him to be imprisoned in bordeaux while in prison he compromised the character of the daughter of his jailer and by her means escaped to america he returned and was again arrested his wife followed him to his cell and it was in this cell that the subject of this lecture was born sixteen thirty five subsequently her miserable father obtained his release sailed with his family to martinique and died there in extreme poverty his wife heartbroken returned to france and got her living by her needle until she too worn out by poverty and misfortune died leaving her daughter to strive as she had striven with a cold and heartless world this daughter became at first a humble dependent on one of her rich relatives and the future wife of louis the fourteenth could be seen on a morning assisting the coachman to groom the horses or following a flock of turkeys with her breakfast in a basket but she was beautiful and bright and panted like most ambitious girls for an entrance into what is called society society at that time in france was brilliant intellectual and wicked there was the blending of calculating interest and religious asceticism when women of the world after having exhausted its pleasures retired to cloisters and sacrificed their natural affections to family pride it was an age of intellectual idlers when men and women having nothing to do spent their times in salons and learned the art of conversation which was followed by the art of letter writing to reach the salons of semi-literary and semi-fashionable people where rank and wealth were balanced by wit became the desire of the young mademoiselle du Abigine. her entrance into society was effected in a curious way at that time there lived in paris about the year sixteen fifty a man whose house was the centre of gay and literary people those who did not like the stiffness of the court or the pedantries of the hotel de rambouillet his name was scarron a popular and ribald poet a comic dramatist a buffoon a sort of rabelais whose inexhaustible wit was the admiration of the city he belonged to a good family and originally was a man of means his uncle had been a bishop and his father a member of the parliament of paris but he had wasted his substance in riotous living and was reduced to a small pension from the government his profession was originally that of a priest and he continued through life to wear the ecclesiastical garb he was full of maladies and miseries and his only relief was in society in spite of his poverty he contrived to give suppers they would now be called dinners which were exceedingly attractive to his house came the noted characters of the day mademoiselle de scuderay the novelist marigny the songwriter ernault the translator of lucretius de gramont the pet of the court chatillon the duchesses de la salière and sevienne even ninon de enclos all bright and fashionable people whose wit and raillery were the admiration of the city it so happened that to a reception of the abbe scarron was brought one day the young lady destined to play so important a part in the history of her country but her dress was too short which so mortified her in the splendid circle to which she was introduced that she burst into tears and scarron was obliged to exert all his tact to comfort her yet she made a good impression since she was beautiful and witty and a letter which she wrote to a friend soon after which letter scarron happened to see was so remarkable that the crippled dramatist determined to make her his wife she only sixteen he forty-two so infirm that he could not walk and so poor that the guests frequently furnished the dishes for the common entertainments 
and with all these physical defects for his body was bent nearly double and notwithstanding that he was one of the coarsest and profanest men of that ungodly age she accepted him what price will not an aspiring woman pay for social position for even a marriage with scarron was to her a step in the ladder of social elevation did she love this bloated and crippled sensualist or was she carried away by admiration of his brilliant conversation or was she actuated by a far-reaching policy i look upon her as a born female jesuit believing in the principle that the end justifies the means nor is such jesuitism incompatible with pleasing manners amiability of temper and great intellectual radiance it equally marked i can fancy jezebel cleopatra and catherine de medici moreover in france it has long been the custom for poor girls to seek eligible matches without reference to love it does not seem that this hideous marriage provoked scandal in fact it made the fortune of mademoiselle d'aubergine she now presided at entertainments which were the gossip of the city and to which stupid dukes aspired in vain for scarron would never have a dull man at his table not even if he were loaded with diamonds and could trace his pedigree to the paladins of charlemagne but by presiding at parties made up of the elite of the fashionable and cultivated society of paris this ambitious woman became acquainted with those who had influence at court so that when her husband died and she was cut off from his life pension and reduced to poverty she was recommended to madame de montespan the king's mistress as the governess of her children it was a judicious appointment madame scarron was then thirty-four in the pride of womanly grace and dignity with rare intellectual gifts and accomplishments there is no education more effective than that acquired by constant intercourse with learned and witty people even the dinner-table is no bad school for one naturally bright and amiable there is more to be learned from conversation than from books the living voice is a great educator madame scarron on the death of her husband was already a queen of society as the governess of montespan's children which was a great position since it introduced her to the notice of the king himself the fountain of all honor and promotion her habits of life were somewhat changed life became more sombre by the irksome duties of educating unruly children and the forced retirement to which she was necessarily subjected she could have lived without this preferment since the pension of her husband was restored to her and could have made her salon the resort of the best society but she had deeper designs not to be the queen of a fashionable circle did she now aspire but to be the leader of a court but this aim she was obliged to hide it could only be compassed by transcendent tact prudence patience and good sense all of which qualities she possessed in an eminent degree it was necessary to gain the confidence of an imperious and jealous mistress which was only to be done by the most humble assiduities before she could undermine her in the affections of the king she had also to gain his respect and admiration without allowing any improper intimacy she had to disarm jealousy and win confidence to be as humble in address as she was elegant in manners and win a selfish man from pleasure by the richness of her conversation and the severity of her own morals little by little she began to exercise a great influence over the mind of the king when he was becoming wearied of the railleries of his exacting favorite and when some of the delusions of life were beginning to be dispelled he then found great solace and enjoyment in the society of madame scarron whom he enriched enabling her to purchase the estate of montenon and to assume its name she soothed his temper softened his resentments and directed his attention to a new field of thought and reflection she was just the opposite of montespan in almost everything the former won by the solid attainments of the mind the latter by her sensual charms the one talked on literature art and religious subjects the other on fetes balls reviews and the glories of the court and its innumerable scandals montenon reminded the king of his duties without sermonizing or moralizing but with the insidious flattery of a devout worshipper of his genius and power montespan directed his mind to pleasures which had lost their charm montenon was always amiable and sympathetic montespan provoked the king by her resentments her imperious exactions her ungovernable fits of temper her haughty sarcasm montespan was calm modest self-possessed judicious wise montespan was passionate extravagant unreasonable montespan always appealed to the higher nature of the king montespan to the lower 
the one was a sincere friend dissuading from folly the other an exacting lover demanding perpetually new favors to the injury of the kingdom and the subversion of the king's dignity of character the former ruled through reason the latter through the passions montaignon was irreproachable in her morals preserved her self-respect and tolerated no improper advances having no great temptations to subdue steadily adhering to that policy which she knew would in time make her society indispensable montespan was content to be simply mistress with no forecast of the future and with but little regard to the interests or honor of her lord montaignon became more attractive every day from the variety of her intellectual gifts and her unwearied efforts to please and instruct montespan although a bright woman amidst the glories of a dazzling court at last wearied disgusted and repelled and yet the woman who gradually supplanted madame de montespan by superior radiance of mind and soul openly remained her friend through all her waning influence and pretended to come to her rescue the friendship of the king for madame de montenon began as early as seventeen sixty two and during the twelve years she was the governess of montespan's children she remained discreet and dignified i dismiss him said she always despairing never repulsed what a transcendent actress what astonishing tact what shrewdness blended with self-control she conformed herself to his tastes and notions at the supper tables of her palsied husband she had been gay unstilted and simple but with the king she had become formal prudish ceremonious fond of etiquette and pharisaical in her religious life she discreetly ruled her royal lover in the name of virtue and piety in sixteen seventy five the king created her marquise de montenon on the disgrace of madame de montespan when the king was forty-six madame de montenon still remained at court having a conspicuous office in the royal household as mistress of the robes to the dauphiness so that her nearness to the king created no scandal she was now a stately woman with sparkling black eyes a fine complexion beautiful teeth and exceedingly graceful manners the king could not now live without her for he needed a counsellor whom he could trust it must be borne in mind that the great colbert on whose shoulder had been laid the burdens of the monarchy had recently died on the death of the queen sixteen eighty five louis made madame de montenon his wife she being about fifty and he forty-seven this private and secret marriage was never openly divulged during the life of the king although generally surmised this placed madame de montenon for she went by this title in a false position to say the least it was humiliating amid all the splendors to which she was raised for if she were a lawful wife she was not a queen some perhaps suppose she was in the position of those favorites whose fate again and again has been to fall one thing is certain the king would have made her his mistress years before but to this she would never consent she was too politic too ambitious too discreet to make that immense mistake yet after the dismissal of montespan she seemed to be such until she had with transcendent art and tact attained her end it is a flaw in her character that she was willing so long to be aspersed showing that power was dearer to her than reputation Bousset, when consulted by the king as to his intended marriage approved of it only on the ground that it was better to make a foolish marriage than violate the seventh commandment la chaise the jesuit confessor who travelled in a coach and six recommended it because madame de montignon was his tool but louvois felt the impropriety as well as fenelon and advised the king not thus to commit himself the dauphin was furious the archbishop of paris simply did his duty in performing the ceremony doubtless reasons of state imperatively demanded that the marriage should not openly be proclaimed and still more that the widow of scarron should not be made the queen of france louis was too much of a politician and too proud a man to make this concession had he raised his unacknowledged wife to the throne it would have resulted in political complications which would have embarrassed his whole subsequent reign he dared not do this he could not thus scandalize all europe and defy all the precedents of france and no one knew this better than madame de montignon herself she appeared to be satisfied if she could henceforth live in virtuous relations her religious scruples are to be respected it is wonderful that she gained as much as she did in that proud cynical and worldly court and from the proudest monarch in the world but louis was not happy without her a proof of his respect and love at the age of forty-seven he needed the counsels of a wife amid his increasing embarrassments he was already wearied sickened and disgusted he now wanted repose friendship and fidelity 
he certainly was guilty of no error in marrying one of the most gifted women of his kingdom perhaps the most accomplished woman of the age interesting and even beautiful at fifty she was then in the perfection of mental and moral fascinations he made no other sacrifice than of his pride his fidelity to his wife and his constant devotion to her until he died proved the sincerity and depth of his attachment and her marvellous influence over him was on the whole good with the exception of her religious intolerance as the wife of louis the fourteenth the power of madame de montignon became almost unbounded her ambition was gratified and her end was accomplished she was the dispenser of court favors the arbiter of fortunes the real ruler of the land her reign was political as well as social she sat in the cabinet of the king and gave her opinions on state matters whenever she was asked her counsels were so wise that they generally prevailed no woman before or after her ever exerted so great an influence on the fortunes of a kingdom as did the widow of the poet scarron the court which she had adorned and ruled was not so brilliant as it had been under madame de montespan but was still magnificent she made it more decorous though probably more dull she was opposed to all foolish expenditures she discouraged the endless fetes and balls and masquerades which made her predecessor so popular but still versailles glittered with unparalleled wonders the fountains played grand equipages crowded the park the courtiers blazed in jewels and velvets and satins the salons were filled with all who were illustrious in france princes nobles ambassadors generals statesmen and ministers rivalled one another in the gorgeousness of their dresses women of rank and beauty displayed their graces in the salon de venus the articles of luxury and taste that were collected in the countless rooms of that vast palace almost exceeded belief and all these blazing rooms were filled even to the attic with aristocratic servitors who poured out perpetual incense to the object of their united idolatry who sat on almost an olympian throne never was a monarch served by such idolaters Bousset and fenelon taught his children bordelot and massillon adorned his chapel la chaise and l'atelier directed his conscience beaulieu and moliere sharpened his wit la rochefoucauld cultivated his taste la fontaine wrote his epigrams racine chronicled his wars de turenne commanded his armies fouquet and colbert arranged his finances mole and de augesso pronounced his judgments louvois laid out his campaigns valbon fortified his citadels riquet dug his canals mansard constructed his palaces poissin decorated his chambers le brun painted his ceilings le nortre laid out his grounds guiardon sculptured his fountains montespan arranged his fetes while la vallier lafayette and sevigny all queens of beauty displayed their graces in the salon de venus what an array of great men and brilliant women to reflect the splendors of an absolute throne never was there such an eclat about a court it was one of the wonders of the age and louis never lost his taste for this outward grandeur he was ceremonious and exacting to the end he never lost the sense of his own omnipotence in his latter days he was sad and dejected but never exhibited his weakness among his worshippers he was always dignified and self-possessed he loved pomp as much as michelangelo loved art even in his bitterest reverses he still maintained the air of the grand monarch says henri martin etiquette without accepting the extravagant restraints which the court of france endured and which french genius would not support assumed an unknown extension proportioned to the increase of royal splendor it was adapted to serve the monarchy at the expense of the aristocracy and tended to make functions prevail over birth the great dukes and peers were multiplied in order to reduce their importance and the king gave the marshals precedence over them the court was a scientific and complicated machine which louis guided with sovereign skill at all hours in all places in the most trifling circumstances of life he was always king his affability never contradicted itself he expressed his interest and kindliness to all he showed himself indulgent to errors that could not be repaired his majesty was tempered by a grave familiarity and he wholly refrained from those pointed and ironical speeches which so cruelly wound when falling from the lips of a man that none can answer he taught all by his example the most exquisite courtesy to women manners acquired unequalled elegance 
the fetes exceeded everything which romance had dreamed in which the fairy splendors that wearied the eye were blended with the noblest pleasures of the intellect but whether appearing in mythological ballets or riding in tournaments in the armor of the heroes of antiquity or presiding at plays and banquets in his ordinary apparel with his thick flowing hair his loose surtout blazing with gold and silver and his profusion of ribbons and plumes always his air and port had something unique always he was the first among all his whole life was like a work of art and the role was admirably played because he played it conscientiously the king was not only sacred but he was supposed to have different blood in his veins from other men his person was invaluable he reigned it was universally supposed by divine right he was a divinely commissioned personage like saul and david he did not reign because he was able or powerful or wealthy because he was a statesman or a general but because he had a right to reign which no one disputed this adoration of royalty was not only universal but it was deeply seated in the minds of men and marked strongly by all the courtiers and generals and bishops and poets who surrounded the throne of louis Bousset and fenelon as well as colbert and louvois racine and moliere as well as conde and turenne especially the nobility of the realm looked up to the king as the source and centre of their own honours and privileges even the people were proud to recognize in him a sort of divinity and all persons stood awestruck in the presence of royalty all this reverence was based on ideas which have ever moved the world such as sustained popes in the middle ages and emperors in ancient born and patriarchal rule among early oriental peoples religion as well as law and patriotism invested monarchs with this sacred and inalienable authority never greater than when louis the fourteenth began to reign but with all his grandeur louis the fourteenth did not know how to avail himself of the advantages which fortune and accident placed in his way he was simply magnificent like xerxes like a man who had entered into a vast inheritance which he did not know what to do with he had no profound views of statesmanship like augustus or tiberius he had no conception of what the true greatness of a country consisted in hence his vast treasures were spent in useless wars silly pomps and inglorious pleasures his grand court became the scene of cabals and rivalries scandals and follies his wars from which he expected glory ended only in shame his great generals passed away without any one to take their place his people instead of being enriched by a development of national resources became poor and discontented while his persecutions decimated his subjects and sowed the seeds of future calamities even the learned men who shed lustre around his throne prostituted their talents to nurse his egotism and did but little to elevate the national character neither pascal with his intense hostility to spiritual despotism nor racine with the severe taste which marked the classic authors of greece and rome nor fenelon with his patriotic enthusiasm and clear perception of the moral strength of empires dared to give full scope to his genius but all were obliged to veil their sentiments in vague panegyrics of ancient heroes at the close of the seventeenth century the great intellectual lights had disappeared under the withering influences of despotism as in ancient rome under the emperors all manly independence had fled and literature went through an eclipse the absorbing egotism which made louis the fourteenth jealous of the fame of conde and luxembourg or fearful of the talents of louvois and colbert or suspicious of the influence of racine and fenelon also led him to degrade his nobility by menial offices and institute in his court a burdensome formality end of section eight section nine of beacon lights of history volume seven great women by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand madame de maintenon part two in spite of his great abilities no monarch ever reaped a severer penalty for his misgovernment than dead louis like solomon he lived long enough to see the bursting of all the bubbles which had floated before his intoxicated brain all his delusions were dispelled he was oppressed with superstitious fears he was weary of the very pleasures of which he once was fondest he saw before him a gulf of national disasters he was obliged to melt up the medallions which commemorated his victories to furnish bread for starving soldiers he lost the provinces he had seized he saw the successive defeat of all his marshals and the annihilation of his veteran armies he was deprived of his children and grandchildren by the most dreadful malady known to that generation 
a feeble infant was the heir of his dominions he saw nothing before him but national disgrace he found no counsellors whom he could trust no friends to whom he could pour out his sorrows the infirmities of age oppressed his body the agonies of remorse disturbed his soul the fear of hell became the foundation of his religion for he must have felt that he had a fearful reckoning with the king of kings such was the man to whom the best days of madame de montignon were devoted and she shared his confidence to the last she did all she could to alleviate his sorrows for a more miserable man than louis the fourteenth during the last twenty years of his life never was seated on a throne well might his wife exclaim save those who occupy the highest places i know of none more unhappy than those who envy them this great woman attempted to make her husband a religious man and succeeded so far as a rigid regard to formalities and technical observances can make a man religious it may be asked how this formal and proper woman was enabled to exert upon the king so great an influence for she was the real ruler of the land no woman ever ruled with more absolute sway from queen esther to madame de pompadour than did the widow of the profane and crippled scarron it cannot be doubted that she exerted this influence by mere mortal and intellectual force the power of physical beauty retreating before the superior radiance of wisdom and virtue la valliere had wearied and montespan had disgusted even a sensual king with all the remarkable attractions but montenon by her prudence her tact her wisdom and her friendship retained the empire she had won thus teaching the immortal lesson that nothing but respect constitutes a sure foundation for love or can hold the heart of a selfish man amid the changes of life whatever the promises made emphatic by passion whatever the presents or favors given as tokens of everlasting ties whatever the raptures consecrating the endearments of a plighted troth whatever the admiration called out by the scintillations of genius whatever the gratitude arising from benefits bestowed in sympathy all will vanish in the heart of a man unless confirmed by qualities which exhort esteem the most impressive truth that can be presented to the mind of woman her encouragement if good her sentence to misery if bad so far as her hopes center around an earthly idol now madame de montignon whatever her defects her pharisaism her cunning her ambition and her narrow religious intolerance was still it would seem always respected not only by the king himself a great discerner of character but by the court which she controlled and even by that gay circle of wits who met around the supper tables of her first husband the breath of scandal never tarnished her reputation she was admired by priests as well as by nobles from this fact which is well attested we infer that she acted with transcendent discretion as the governess of the duke of maine even when brought into the most intimate relations with the king and that when reigning at the court after the death of the queen she must have been supposed to have a right to all the attentions which she received from louis the fourteenth and what is very remarkable about this woman is that she should so easily have supplanted madame de montespan in the full blaze of her dazzling beauty when the king was in the maturity of his power and in all the pride of external circumstance she born a protestant converted to catholicism in her youth under protest poor dependent a governess the widow of a vulgar buffoon and with antecedents which must have stung to the quick so proud a man as was louis the fourteenth with his severe taste his experience his discernment with all the cynical and hostile influences of a proud and worldly court and after a long and searching intimacy it is hard to believe that he could have loved and honored her to his death if she had not been worthy of his esteem and when we remember that for nearly forty years she escaped the scandals which made those times unique in infamy we are forced to concede that on the whole she must have been a good woman to retain such unbounded power for over thirty years is a very remarkable thing to do madame de montenon however though wise and virtuous made many grave mistakes as she had many defects of character great as she was she has to answer for political crimes to which from her narrow religious prejudices she led the king the most notable feature in the influence which madame de montignon exercised on the king was in inciting a spirit of religious intolerance and this appeared even long before madame de montespan had lost her ascendancy for ten years before the revocation of the edict of nantes there had been continual persecution of the protestants in france on the grounds that they were heretics though not rebels and the same persecuting spirit was displayed in reference to the jansenists who were catholics and whose only sin was intellectual boldness anybody who thought differently from the monarch incurred the royal displeasure 
Intellectual freedom and honesty were the real reasons of the disgrace of Racine and Fenelon. For the king was a bigot in religion as well as a despot on a throne. He fancied that he was very pious. He was regular in all his religious duties. He was an earnest and conscientious adherent to all the doctrines of the Catholic Church. In his judgment, a departure from those doctrines should be severely punished. He was as sincere as Torquemada, or Alva, or St. Dominic. His wife encouraged this bigotry, and even stimulated his resentments toward those who differed from him. At last, in 1685, the fatal blow was struck which decimated the subjects of an irresponsible king. The glorious edict which Henry the Fourth had granted, and which even Richelieu and Mazarin had respected, was repealed. There was no political necessity for the crime. It sprang from unalloyed religious intolerance, and it was as suicidal as it was uncalled for and cruel. It was an immense political blunder which no enlightened monarch would ever have committed, and which none but a cold and narrow woman would ever have encouraged. There was no excuse or palliation from this abominable persecution any more than there was for the burning of John Huss. It had not even as much to justify it as had the slaughter of St. Bartholomew, for the Huguenots were politically hostile and dangerous. It was an act of wanton cruelty incited by religious bigotry. I wonder how a woman so kind-hearted, so intelligent, and so politic as Madame de Montenon doubtless was, could have encouraged the king to a measure which undermined his popularity, which cut the sinews of natural strength, and raised up implacable enemies in every Protestant country. I can palliate her detestable bigotry only on the ground that she was the slave of an order of men who have ever proved to themselves to be the inveterate foes of human freedom, and who marked their footsteps wherever they went by a trail of blood. Louis was equally their blinded tool. The order, the Society of Jesus, was created to extirpate heresy, and in this instance it was carried out to the bitterest end. The persecution of the Protestants under Louis the Fourteenth was the most cruel and successful of all known persecutions in ancient or modern times. It annihilated the Protestants, so far as there were any left openly to defend their cause. It drove out of France from 200,000 to 400,000 of her best people, and executed or confined to the galleys as many more. They died like sheep led to the slaughter. They died not with arms, but Bibles in their hands. I have already presented some details of that inglorious persecution in my lecture on Louis the Fourteenth, and will not repeat what I there said. It was deemed by Madame de Montignon a means of grace to the king, for in her way she always sought his conversion and when the bloody edict went forth for the slaughter of the best people in the land, she wrote that the king was now beginning to think seriously of his salvation. If God preserve him, there will be no longer but one religion in the kingdom. This foul stain on her character did not proceed from cruelty of disposition, but from mistaken zeal. What a contrast her conduct was to the policy of Elizabeth! Yet she was no worse than Letelier, La Chaise, and other fanatics. Religious intolerance was one of the features of the age and of the Roman Catholic Church. But religious bigotry is eternally odious to enlightened reason. No matter how interesting a man or woman may be in most respects, if stained with cruel intolerance and religious opinions, he or she will be repulsive. It left an indelible stain on the character of the most brilliant and gifted woman of her times, and makes us forget her many virtues. With all her excellence, she goes down in history as a cold and intolerant woman whom we cannot love. We cannot forget that in a great degree, through her influence, the Edict of Nantes was repealed. The persecution of the Protestants, however, partially reveals the narrow intolerance of Madame de Montignon. She sided but with those whose influence was directed to the support of the recognized dogmas of the Church in their connection with the absolute rule of kings. The interests of the Catholic institutions have ever been identical with absolutism. Bousset, the ablest theologian and churchman which the Catholic Church produced in the 17th century, gave the whole force of his vast intellect to uphold an unlimited royal authority. He saw in the bold philosophical speculations of Descartes, Malebranche, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Locke an insidious undermining of the doctrines of the Church, an intellectual freedom whose logical result would be fatal alike to Church and State. His eagle eye penetrated to the core of every system of human thought. He saw the logical and necessary result of every theory which pantheists or rationalists or quietists or Jansenists advanced. Whatever did not support the dogmas of medieval and patriotic theologians, such as the papal church endorsed, was regarded by him with suspicion and aversion. Every theory or speculation which tended to emancipate the mind or weaken the authority of the church 
or undermine an absolute throne was treated by him with dogmatic intolerance and persistent hatred he made war alike on the philosophers the jansenists and the quietists whether they remained in the ranks of the church or not it was the dangerous consequence of these speculations pushed to their logical result which he feared and detested and which no other eye than his was able to perceive Bousset communicated his spirit to Madame de Montignon and to the king, who were both under his influence as to the treatment of religious or philosophical questions. Louis and his wife were both devout supporters of orthodoxy, that is, the received doctrines of the church, partly from conservative tendencies and partly from the connection of established religious institutions with absolutism in government. Whatever was established was supported because it was established. They would suffer no innovation, not even in philosophy anything progressive was abhorred as much as anything destructive when fenelon said i love my family better than myself my country better than my family and the human race better than my country he gave utterance to a sentiment which was revolutionary in its tendency when he declared in his telemaque what were the duties of kings that they reigned for the benefit of their subjects rather than for themselves he undermined the throne which he openly supported it was the liberal spirit which animated Fenelon, as well as the innovations to which his opinions logically led, which arrayed him against the king who admired him, the woman who had supported him, and the bishop who was jealous of him. Although he charmed everybody with whom he associated by the angelic sweetness of his disposition, his refined courtesies of manner, and his sparkling but inoffensive wit, a born courtier as well as philosopher, the most interesting and accomplished man of his generation, still neither Bousset nor Madame de Montignon nor the king could tolerate his teachings, so pregnant were they with innovations, and he was exiled to his bishopric. Madame de Montignon, who once delighted in Fenelon, learned to detest him as much as Bousset did when the logical tendencies of his writings were seen. She would rivet the chains of slavery on the human intellect as well as on the devotees of Rome or the courtiers of the king, while Fenelon would have emancipated the race itself in the fervor and sincerity of his boundless love. This hostility towards Fenelon was not caused entirely by the political improvements he would have introduced, but because his all-embracing toleration sought to protect the sentimental pantheism which Madame Guillon inculcated in her maxims of disinterested love and voluntary passivity of the soul towards God, in opposition to that rationalistic pantheism which Spinoza defended, and into which he had inexorably pushed with unexampled logic the deductions of Malebranche. The men who finally overturned the fabric of despotism which Richelieu constructed were the philosophers. The clear but narrow intellect of the king and his wife instinctively saw in them the natural enemies of the throne, and hence they were frowned upon, if not openly, persecuted. We are forced, therefore, to admit that the intolerance of Madame de Montignon, repulsive as it was, arose in part like the intolerance of Bousset, from zeal to uphold the institutions and opinions on which the church and the throne were equally based. The Jesuits would call such a woman a nursing mother of the church, a protector of the cause of orthodoxy, the watchful guardian of the royal interests, and those of all established institutions. Any ultra-conservatism, logically carried out, would land any person on the ground where she stood. But while Madame de Montignon was a foe to everything like heresy, or opposition to the Catholic Church, or true intellectual freedom, she was the friend of education. She was the founder of the celebrated School of St. Seer, where three hundred young ladies, daughters of impoverished nobles, were educated gratuitously. She ever took the greatest interest in this school, and devoted to it all the time her numerous engagements would permit. She visited it every day, and was really its president and director. There was never a better school for aristocratic girls in the Catholic country. She directed their studies and superintended their manners, and brought to bear on their culture her own vast experience. If Bousset was born a priest, she was born a teacher. It was for the amusement of the girls that Racine was induced by her to write one of his best dramas, Queen Esther, a sort of religious tragedy in the severest taste, which was performed by the girls in the presence of the most distinguished people of the court. Madame de Montignon exerted her vast influence in favor of morality and learning. She rewarded genius and scholarship. She was the patron of those distinguished men who rendered important services to France, whether statesmen, divines, generals, or scholars. She sought to bring to the royal notice eminent merit in every department of life within the ranks of orthodoxy. A poet or painter or orator who gave remarkable promise was sure of her kindness, and there were many such. For the world is full at all times of remarkable young men and women, but there are very few remarkable men at the age of fifty. And her influence on the court was equally good, 
she discouraged levities gossip and dissipation if the palace was not so gay during the reign of madame de montespan it was more decorous and more intellectual it became fashionable to go to church and to praise good sermons and read books of casuistry tartuffe grew pale before escobar Bousset and Bourdaloue were equal oracles with Molière and Racine. Great preachers were all the fashion. The court became very decorous, if it was hypocritical. The king interested himself in theological discussions and became as austere as formerly he was gay and merry. He regretted his wars and his palace building, for both were discouraged by Madame de Montignon, who perceived that they impoverished the nation she undertook the mighty task of reforming the court itself as well as the morals of the king and she partially succeeded the proud nebuchadnezzar whom she served was at last made to confess that there was a god to whom he was personally responsible and he was encouraged to bear with dignity those sad reverses which humiliated his pride and drank without complaint the dregs of that bitter cup which retributive justice held out in mercy before he died it was his wife who revealed the deceitfulness the hypocrisy the treachery and the heartlessness of that generation of vipers which he had trusted and enriched she was more than the guardian of his interests she was his faithful friend who dissuaded him from follies so that outwardly louis the fourteenth became a religious man and could perhaps have preached a sermon on the vanity of worldly life that whatever is born in vanity must end in vanity it is greatly to the credit of madame de montignon that she was interested in whatever tended to improve the morals of the people or to develop the intellect she was one of those strong-minded women who are impressible by grand sentiments she would have admired madame de stael or madame roland not their opinions but their characters politics was perhaps the most interesting subject to her as it has ever been to very cultivated women in france and it was with the details of cabinets and military enterprises that she was most familiar it was this political knowledge which made her so wise a counsellor and so necessary a companion to the king but her reign was nevertheless a usurpation she triumphed in consequence of the weakness of her husband more than by her own strength and the nation never forgave her she outraged the honour of the king and detracted from the dignity of the royal station louis the fourteenth certainly had the moral right to marry her as a nobleman may espouse a servant girl but it was a faux pas which the proud idolaters of rank could not excuse and for this usurpation madame de montignon paid no inconsiderable a penalty she was insulted by the royal family to the day of her death the dauphin would not visit her even when the king led him to the door of her apartments the courtiers mocked her behind her back her rivals thrust upon her their envenomed libels even racine once so far forgot himself as to allude in her presence to the miserable farces of the poet scarron an unpremeditated and careless insult which she never forgot or forgave moreover in all her grandeur she was doomed to the most exhaustive formalities and duties for the king exacted her constant services which wearied and disgusted her she was born for freedom but was really a slave although she wore gilded fetters she was not what one would call an unhappy or disappointed woman since she attained the end to which she had aspired but she could not escape humiliations she was in a false position her reputation was aspersed she was only a wife whose marriage was concealed she was not a queen all she gained she extorted in rising to the exalted height of ruling the court of france she yet abdicated her throne as an untrammelled queen of society became the slave of a pompous ceremonious self-conscious egotistical selfish peevish self-indulgent tyrannical exacting priest-ridden worn-out disenchanted old voluptuary and when he died she was treated as a usurper rather than a wife and was obliged to leave the palace where she would have been insulted and take up her quarters in the convent she had founded the king did not leave her by his will a large fortune so that she was obliged to curtail her charities madame de montignon lived to be eighty-four and retained her intellectual faculties to the last retiring to the abbey of st cyr on the death of the king in seventeen fifteen and surviving him but four years she was beloved and honored by those who knew her intimately she was the idol of the girls of st cyr who worshipped the ground on which she trod yet she made no mark in history after the death of louis the fourteenth all her greatness was but the reflection of his glory her life successful as it was is but a confirmation of the folly of seeking a position which is not legitimate no position is truly desirable which is a false one which can be retained only by art and which subjects one to humiliation and mortifications i have great admiration for the many excellent qualities of this extraordinary and gifted woman although i know she is not a favorite with historians she is not endeared to the heart of the nation she indirectly ruled 
she is positively disliked by a large class not merely for her narrow religious intolerance but even for the arts by which she gained so great an influence yet liked or disliked it would be difficult to find in french history a greater or more successful woman authorities henri martin's history of france biographique universe miss pardot's history of the court of louis the fourteenth la Cretelle's history of france saint simon's memoirs voltaire's cycle de louis the fourteenth guizot's history of france early days of madame de montignon eclectic magazine volume thirty two page sixty seven life and character of madame de montignon quarterly review volume ninety six page three ninety four fortnightly review volume thirty five page six hundred seven temple bar volume fifty five page two forty three fraser volume thirty nine page two thirty one memoirs of louis the fourteenth quarterly review volume forty nine page forty six james's life and time of louis the fourteenth james's life of madame de montignon secret correspondence of madame de montignon tyne on the ancient regime browning's history of the huguenots edinburgh review volume ninety nine page four hundred and fifty four butler's lives of fenelon and bousset abbe ledis memoir de bousset bentley memoirs de madame de montespan volume forty eight page three o nine de bosset's life of fenelon end of section nine section ten of beacon lights of history volume seven great women by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand sarah duchess of marlborough part one a d sixteen sixty to seventeen forty four the woman of the world in the career of madame de montaignon we have seen in a woman an inordinate ambition to rise in the world and control public affairs in the history of the duchess of marlborough we see the same ambition the same love of power the same unscrupulous adaptation of means to an end yet the aim and ends of these two remarkable political women were different the french woman had in view the reform of a wicked court the interests of education the extirpation of heresy the elevation of men of genius the social and religious improvement of a great nation as she viewed it through a man who bore absolute sway the Englishwoman connived at political corruptions, was indifferent to learning and genius, and exerted her great influence, not for the good of her country, but to advance the fortunes of her family. Madame de Montaignon, if narrow and intolerant, was unselfish, charitable, religious, and patriotic. The Duchess of Marlborough was selfish, grasping, avaricious, and worldly in all her aspirations both were ambitious the one to benefit the country which she virtually ruled and the other to accumulate honors and riches by cabals and intrigues in the court of a weak woman whom she served and despised madame de montaignon in a greater position as the wife of the most powerful monarch in christendom was gentle amiable condescending and kind-hearted the duchess of marlborough was haughty insolent and acrimonious both were beautiful bright witty and intellectual but the french woman was immeasurably more cultivated and was impressible by grand sentiments and yet the duchess of marlborough was a great woman she was the most prominent figure in the court of queen anne and had a vast influence on the politics of her day her name is associated with great statesmen and generals she occupied the highest social position of any woman in england after that of the royal family she had the ear and the confidence of the queen the greatest offices were virtually at her disposal around her we may cluster the leading characters and events of the age of queen anne sarah jennings the future duchess of marlborough was born in sixteen sixty she belonged to a good though not a noble family which for many generations possessed a good estate in hertfordshire her grandfather sir john jennings was a zealous adherent to the royal cause before the revolution and received the order of the bath in company with his patron charles i then prince of wales when sarah was twelve years of age she found a kind friend in the duchess of york mary beatrice eleonora princess of modena an adopted daughter of louis the fourteenth who married james brother of charles the second the young girl was thus introduced 
to the dangerous circle which surrounded the duke of york and she passed her time not in profitable studies but in amusements and revels she lived in the ducal household as a playmate of the princess anne and was a beautiful bright and witty young lady though not well educated in the year sixteen seventy three she became acquainted with john churchill a colonel of the army and a gentleman of the bedchamber to the duke of york the latter a post of honor but of small emolument he was at that time twenty-three years of age a fine-looking and gallant soldier who had already distinguished himself at the siege of tangier he had also fought under the banners of marshal turenne in the low countries by whom he was called the handsome englishman at the siege of maestricht he further advanced his fortunes succeeding the famous earl of peterborough in the command of the english troops then in alliance with louis the fourteenth he was not a man of intellectual culture nor was he deeply read it is said that even his spelling was bad but his letters were clear and forcible he made up his deficiency in education by irresistibly pleasing manners remarkable energy and a coolness of judgment that was seldom known to err his acquaintance with the beautiful sarah jennings soon ripened into love but he was too poor to marry nor had she a fortune they however became engaged to each other and the betrothal continued three years it was not till sixteen seventy eight that the marriage took place the colonel was domestic in his tastes and amiable in his temper and his home was happy he was always fond of his wife although her temper was quick and her habits exacting she was proud irascible and overbearing while he was meek and gentle in other respects they were equally matched since both were greedy ambitious and worldly a great stain too rested on his character for he had been scandalously intimate with barbara villiers mistress of charles the second who gave him five thousand pounds with which he bought an annuity of five hundred pounds a year thus enabling him to marry miss jennings in sixteen eighty five charles the second died and was succeeded by his brother the duke of york as james the second the new king rewarded his favorite colonel churchill with a scotch peerage and the command of a regiment of guards james's two daughters the princesses mary and anne now become great personages but from mutual jealousy they did not live together very harmoniously mary the elder daughter was much the superior of her sister and her marriage with william of orange was particularly happy the princess anne was weak and far from being interesting but she was inordinately attached to lady churchill who held a high post of honor and emolument in her household it does not appear that the attachment was mutual between these two ladies but the forms of it were kept up by lady churchill who had ambitious ends to gain she gradually acquired an absolute ascendancy over the mind of the princess who could not live happily without her companionship and services lady churchill was at this time remarkably striking in her appearance with a clear complexion regular features majestic figure and beautiful hair which was dressed without powder she also had great power of conversation was frank outspoken and amusing but without much tact the princess wrote to her sometimes four times a day always in the strain of humility and seemed utterly dependent upon her anne was averse to reading spending her time at cards and frivolous pleasures she was fond of etiquette and exacting in trifles she was praised for her piety which would appear however to have been formal and technical she was placid phlegmatic and had no conversational gifts she played tolerably on the guitar loved the chase and rode with the hounds until disabled by the gout which was brought about by the pleasures of the table in sixteen eighty three she married prince george of denmark and by him had thirteen children not one of whom survived her most of them died in infancy as the daughter of james the second she was of course a tory in her political opinions lady churchill was also at that time a moderate tory and fanned the prejudices of her mistress but in order to secure a still greater intimacy and freedom than was consistent with their difference in rank the two ladies assumed the names of mrs morley and mrs freeman in the correspondence between them the character of the princess appears to the greater advantage since she was at least sincere in her admiration and friendship she assumes no superiority in any respect in her intellectual dependence she is even humble anne was seemingly disinterested in her friendship with lady churchill having nothing to gain but services for which she liberally compensated her but the society of a weak woman could not have had as much fascination for so independent and self-sustained a person as was the proud peeress it eventually became irksome to her 
but there was no outward flaw in the friendship until anne ascended the throne in seventeen o two not even for several years after the accession of william and mary in sixteen eighty nine changed the position of anne to whom the nation now looked as a probable future queen she was at that time severely censured for her desertion of her father james and her conduct seemed both heartless and frivolous but she was virtually in the hands of an unscrupulous woman and the great ministers of state on the flight of the king james the second the princess anne retired to chatsworth the magnificent seat of the earl of devonshire accompanied by lady churchill her inseparable companion two days before the coronation of william and mary lord churchill was created earl of marlborough and was sworn a member of the privy council and a lord of the bedchamber this elevation was owing to his military talents which no one appreciated better than the king who however never personally liked marlborough and still less his ambitious wife he was no stranger to their boundless cupidity though he pretended not to see it he was politic not being in a position to dispense with the services of the ablest military general of his realm william the third was a remarkably wise and clear-headed prince and saw the dangers which menaced him the hostility of louis the fourteenth the rebels in ireland and the disaffection among the jacobite nobility in england who secretly favored the exiled monarch so he rewarded and elevated a man whom he both admired and despised william had many sterling virtues he was sincere and patriotic and public-spirited he was a staunch protestant of the calvinistic school and very attentive to his religious duties but with all his virtues and services to the english nation he was not a favorite his reserve coldness and cynicism were in striking contrast with the affability of the stuarts he had no imagination and no graces he disgusted the english nobles by drinking holland gin and by his brusque manners but nothing escaped his eagle eye on the field of battle he was as ardent and fiery as he was dull and phlegmatic at hampton court his favorite residence he was capable of a warm friendship uninteresting as he seemed to the english nobles but he was intimate only with his dutch favorites like bentick and keppel whom he elevated to english peerages he spent only a few months in england each year of the thirteen of his reign being absorbed in war most of the time with louis the fourteenth and the irish rebels william found that his english throne was anything but a bed of roses the tories and the tumults and dangers attending the flight of james the second had promoted his elevation but they were secretly hostile and when dangers had passed broke out in factious opposition the high church clergy disliked a calvinistic king in sympathy with dissenters the irish gave great trouble under tyrconnel and old marshal schomberg the latter of whom was killed at the battle of the boyne a large party was always in opposition to the unceasing war with louis the fourteenth whom william hated with implacable animosity the earl of marlborough on the accession of william was a moderate tory and was soon suspected of not being true to his sovereign his treason might have resulted in the return of the stuarts but for the energy and sagacity of queen mary in whose hands the supreme executive power was placed by william when absent from the kingdom she summoned at once the parliament prevented the defection of the navy and ferreted out the hostile intrigues in which the lord treasurer godolphin was also implicated but for the fortunate naval victory of la hogue over the french fleet which established the naval supremacy of england the throne of william and the protestant succession would have been seriously endangered for william was unfortunate in his flemish campaigns when the king was apprised of the treasonable intrigues which endangered his throne he magnanimously pardoned godolphin and the duke of shrewsbury but sent marlborough to the tower although he soon after released him when it was found that several of the letters which compromised him had been forged for some time marlborough lived in comparative retirement while his wife devoted herself to politics and her duties about the person of princess anne who was treated very coldly by her sister the queen and was even deprived of her guards but the bickerings and quarrels of the royal sisters were suddenly ended by the death of mary from the smallpox which then fearfully raged in london the grief of the king was sincere and excessive as well as that of the nation and his affliction softened his character and mitigated his asperity against marlborough shortly after the death of his queen william made marlborough the governor of the duke of gloucester then sixteen ninety eight a very promising prince in the tenth year of his age this prince the only surviving son of anne had a feeble body and was unwisely crammed by bishop burnet his preceptor and overworked by marlborough who taught him military tactics 
neither his body nor his mind could stand the strain made upon him and he was carried off at the age of eleven by a fever the untimely death of the prince was a great disappointment to the nation and cast a gloom over the remaining years of the reign of william who from this time declined in health and spirits one of his last acts was to appoint the earl of marlborough general of the troops of flanders knowing that he was the only man who could successfully oppose the marshals of france only five days before his death the king sent a recommendation to parliament for the union of scotland and england and the last act of parliament to which he gave his consent was that which fixed the succession in the house of hanover at the age of fifty-one while planning the campaign which was to make marlborough immortal william received his death stroke which was accidental he was riding in the park of hampton court when his horse stumbled and he was thrown dislocating his collarbone the bone was set and might have united but for the imprudence of the king who insisted on going to kensington on important business fever set in and in a few days this noble and heroic king died march eighth seventeen o two the greatest of the english kings since the wars of the roses to whom the english nation owed the peaceful settlement of the kingdom in times of treason and rebellion the princess anne at the age of thirty-seven quietly ascended the throne and all eyes were at once turned to marlborough on whom the weight of public affairs rested he was now fifty-three active wise well poised experienced and generally popular in spite of his ambition and treason he had as we have already remarked been a moderate tory but as he was the advocate of war measures he now became one of the leaders of the whig party indeed he was at this time the foremost man in england on account of his great talents as a statesman and diplomatist as well as general and for the ascendancy of his wife over the mind of the queen next to him in power was the lord treasurer godolphin to whom he was bound by ties of friendship family alliance and political principles like marlborough godolphin had in early life been attached to the service of the house of stuart he had been page to charles the second and lord chamberlain to mary of modena the princess anne when a young lady became attached to this amiable and witty man and would have married him if reasons of state had not prevented after the revolution of sixteen eighty eight his merits were so conspicuous that he was retained in the service of william and mary and raised to the peerage in sound judgment extraordinary sagacity untiring industry and unimpeached integrity he resembled lord burleigh in the reign of elizabeth and like him rendered great public services grave economical cautious upright courteous in manners he was just the man for the stormy times in which he lived he had his faults being fond of play the passion of that age and of women says swift who libelled him as he did every prominent man of the whig party he could scratch out a song in praise of his mistress with a pencil on a card or overflow with tears like a woman when he had an object to gain but the real ruler of the land on the accession of anne was the favored wife of marlborough if ever a subject stood on the very pinnacle of greatness it was she all the foreign ambassadors flattered her and paid court to her the greatest nobles solicited or bought of her the lucrative offices in the gift of the crown she was the dispenser of court favors as mesdames de maintenon and pompadour were in france she was the admiration of gifted circles in which she reigned as a queen of society poets sang her praises and extolled her beauty statesmen craved her influence nothing took place at court to which she was not privy she was the mainspring of all political cabals and intrigues even the queen treated her with deference as well as loaded her with gifts and godolphin consulted her on affairs of state the military fame of her husband gave her unbounded eclat no englishwoman ever had such an exalted social position she reigned in salons as well as in the closet of the queen and she succeeded in marrying her daughters to the proudest peers her eldest daughter henrietta was the wife of an earl and prime minister her second daughter anne married lord charles spencer the only son of the earl of sunderland one of the leaders of the whig party and secretary of state her third daughter became the wife of the earl afterwards duke of bridgewater and the fourth and youngest daughter had for her husband the celebrated duke of montague grand master of the order of the bath thus did sarah jennings rise her daughters were married to great nobles and statesmen her husband was the most famous general of his age and she herself was the favorite and confidential friend and adviser of the queen upon her were showered riches and honor she had both influence and power influence from her talents and power from her position and when she became a duchess after the great victory of blenheim and a princess of the german empire she had nothing more to aspire to in the way of fortune or favor or rank 
she was the first woman of the land next to the queen whom she ruled while nominally serving her there are very few people in this world whether men or women who remain unchanged under the influence of boundless prosperity so rare are the exceptions that the rule is established wealth honor and power will produce luxury pride and selfishness how few can hope to be superior to solomon mohammed constantine theodosius louis the fourteenth madame de montignon queen elizabeth maria theresa or napoleon in that sublime self-control which looks down on the temptations of earth with placid indifference of a marcus aurelius even prosperous people in comparatively humble life generally become arrogant and opinionated and like to have things in their own way now lady marlborough was both proud by nature and the force of circumstances she became an incarnation of arrogance which she could not conceal and which she never sought to control when she became the central figure in the court and in the state flattered and sought after wherever she went before whom the greatest nobles burned their incense and whom the people almost worshipped in a country which has ever idolized rank and power she assumed airs and gave vent to expressions that wounded her friend the queen anne bore her friend's intolerable pride blended with disdain for a long time after her accession but her own character also began to change sovereigns do not like dictation from subjects however powerful and when securely seated on her throne anne began to avow opinions which she had once found it politic to conceal she soon became as jealous of her prerogative as her uncle charles and her father james had been of theirs she was at heart a tory as was natural and attached to the interests of her banished relatives she looked upon the whigs as hostile to what she held dear she began to dislike ministers who had been in high favor with the late king especially lord chancellor Somers and charles montague earl of halifax since these powerful nobles allied with godolphin and marlborough ruled england thus the political opinions of the queen came gradually to be at variance with those advanced by her favorite whose daughters were married to great whig nobles and whose husband was bent on continuing the war against louis the fourteenth and the exiled stuarts but as we have said and for a long time suppressed her feelings of incipient alienation produced by the politics and haughty demeanor of her favorite and still wrote to her as her beloved mrs freeman and signed her letters as usual as her humble morley her treatment of the countess continued the same as ever full of affection and confidence she did not break with a friend who had so long been indispensable to her nor had she strength of character to reveal her true feelings End of section 10.